if I would have asked my wife, I was, I was just to holler, babe, what's what's my what's my biggest job? It, 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 she, she would reply quickly, meeting the expectations of man. When their expectation is not met, some of them are hurt. Mm -hmm. Case in point, give you a real practical example. <laughs> some people come from a family church environment. Some people come from a mega ministry environment. <clears throat> family church environment is expecting to see the pastor when they get sick yeah yeah the mega ministry model you ain't gonna ever see joel osteen moses being called to his assignment was trying to act like he was a family church pastor when he had thousands of people that he was responsible for and he was trying to touch all of them and answer every situation that they needed. And his father-in-law, Jethro, thus the name, the Jethro principle told him, son, what you're trying to do is absolutely suicidal. Well, welcome, soulmates. It's a uh, another opportunity for us to come before you, and we're excited about our guest today. And it is none other than Bishop Adrian Starks of World Victory International Christian Center, or as we affectionately call it, the World Victory Church here in Greensboro, North Carolina. And uh, I'm, I'm particularly excited. Uh, we have been talking about the second half and we started off this year looking at the second half and second half living and living it with a purpose um, and, and pushing forward with true living in the second half of life. And we started with health. So we've talked about physical health. We talked a little bit about mental health. Um, we're going to do some some talking as well at a point about financial health and spiritual health is also an area that we absolutely need to cover. And when Darren and I were talking, I said, hey, there's one person I want to talk to about this spiritual health piece, and that is none other than Bishop Stark. So we're we're excited to have you. We're going to let, let Bishop Stark tell a little bit about himself, but just as a very brief intro, born and raised in Brooklyn. New York, which I got to hear about what that experience was like for you coming up. Um, serves on more boards than than I can name. Um, he's absolutely a civic leader here in Greensboro. Uh, is a graduate of North Carolina a and Studied at Regent University and is currently working on Masters in Divinity at Wake Forest University, my other alma mater. So uh, go Deeks. And uh, we know you're going go, to going to get through there um, and bring what you've learned back here to Greensboro. Um, he is an author, songwriter, vocalist, and truly gives God all the praise for the talents that the Lord has blessed him with. Uh, Bishop is married to Pastor Shandi Barksdale Starks, and they have five beautiful daughters, and I'm going to let, let you talk about them as well. But man, we are, we are pleased excited to have you here with us on the soul of a man podcast brothers i can't tell you the joy that i feel to be able to be included in such a uh, able and necessary work such as uh the soul of a man you guys have launched out into some deep waters uh, but you certainly uh, bring uh, the steady and grace and to be included uh, just makes me smile. I'm, I'm honored. I truly am honored. And uh, as you said, Brother Mike, I am uh, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and um, I'm actually the seventh of 11 children. Wow. And, um, you know, being in Brooklyn during those times, it was uh, uh, less costly in comparison to, to today's cost of living. Uh, but it was comparable. And so, you know, things were 
were scarce. And uh, I learned the uh, principles of, of timeliness and timing uh, because if you didn't get to the breakfast table in, in the right timing, you you would be on the short end of the stick. <laughs> and so I've learned that principle early. The early bird gets the worm. Right. Um, right. I'm I'm so uh, grateful for that rearing that I experienced. No, we weren't rich, uh, but uh, we had tremendous love and tremendous uh, depth. Uh, I say it all the time. I am one of the more fortunate people in the world because I've had six siblings to go before me and to uh, afford me the opportunity to learn from their mistakes so that I didn't have to repeat them. So should I do that, you know, shame on me because I, I didn't leverage something uh, that was blessed uh, for me to have. And uh, I love them for it. Uh, you know, I, I think in an earlier time, we we discussed some of my uh, spiritual uh, grounding in the city. My family came out of Cornerstone Baptist Church under the uh, late, great Sandy Ray, uh, Reverend Dr. Sandy Ray and um, and mom uh, born and raised in Brooklyn. My dad was from Virginia. And um, but mom took us into a different expression of the church in the Pentecostal persuasion. And um, and so uh when i add the the fact that i married a uh an episcopalian uh i know all branches of the faith you know the, the episcopal church is just a step below the the catholic church and so i have i have such a broad perspective of the body of christ and um uh what i do know is that we are in sync under the banner of Jesus Christ, and that's what matters most. Amen. Amen. Good stuff. Good stuff. I'm I'm familiar with Cornerstone and been there several times. I lived in Bed Stuy for three years, so we yeah. were we were real real close, a couple of blocks away. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It is a it is a uh, a historic site, um, even if it has not reached the. Uh, official status, just because it's it's got such a longevity in the community, uh, it's certainly a centennial church that um, that uh, its reputation precedes itself. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so come up in Brooklyn, and somehow or another, you truly end up in God's country <laughs> in North Carolina. <laughs> at North Carolina a t State University. How in the world did that happen? I, I came to a t to play football. And so I was um, recruited to come to a t along with one of my high school uh, partners. Um, he and I came down, Brother Jamal, uh, and neither of us uh, wanted to go back to New York. We both He's in South Carolina. I'm in North Carolina. And um, he's raising his, his family. Now he's he's entered into granddaddy stage. I, I haven't been fortunate enough to do that because he started a lot earlier than me. Um, and and, uh, you know, I fell in love with this Greensboro girl uh -huh. and she told me quickly she did not want to go to New York. And so here we are. Here we are. We're still in the triad and raising our five girls. I've got. Uh, uh, one, well, actually three in college right now. Uh, one is at Duke, another is at Carolina, and one is at Bowdoin College in Maine. And then we got a junior, I mean, a, a sophomore in high school. And uh, it would be, it, I guess it's befitting that we got a, a surprise who who is now in the fourth grade. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're running the gamut. I tell people all the time that I will never have an empty nest. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. We, we, we have something in common. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's got to be interesting um, to be the sole man in a house of six women. It is. It is. It it teaches me great patience. It teaches me uh, compassion. It teaches me self control because there are times where. I, I, it doesn't benefit me to say much. And so I, I've learned to say little. And whenever I do speak, 
to make it count. Good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> and I suspect you, uh, Bishop, you have to learn to say uh, no. Learn to say no because I'm sure there are a lot of yeses with five girls. It is, it, it, and no doesn't come regularly. Right. Uh, I, I will admit my my uh, softer side does tend to to surface more than uh, than not, and it's hard. I I don't I don't ever like to see tears, and uh, I think they learned that early. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is that that is girls got got you wrapped. Oh, right? man. It's it's tough for me to say no when the tears start flowing. I understand. I understand. <laughs> I, I have one, and I I get it completely, completely, completely. Well, let's let's jump into it. Um, you know, just a lot of questions, and um, this is coming from two guys who were really churched our whole lives, um, and and we've kind of got slightly different paths now um in that regard um but never any question of of where i come from and who i come from and and who i've got to be grateful to for the blessings that i i, I have um but you know in, a, in an interesting place in my own walk right now but um you know just wanted to start and as you know post pandemic we went through a horrific period with COVID-19 and the pandemic um, just a couple of years ago. Um, and post-pandemic, where is the church? And we're specifically talking tonight about the Black church. Where are we? The, the church universal uh, is in a, uh, a time of, of being redefined and uh, it's not just recovery. We're going through a redefining process. Uh, what we have made reference as church from our formative years, in many regards, doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And if there are remnants of its existence, it's just that, it's remnants, uh, because uh, the focal point has changed. Um, the expectations have changed. And uh, those who were not able to make the shift that the pandemic brought, a, brought upon us unrelentingly and um, without warning, many mm -hmm. did not survive. And we are now um, facing this paradigm shift uh, that also is requiring those who held on to appreciate um, how to continue to uh, morph, if you will. Uh, how do you continue to keep the budget and um, and and still meet the needs of the people, still fulfill the the great commissioning, quote unquote, um, in this new environment? Yeah. And those who don't pivot well, they're being exposed. Mm. They're being exposed. Um, it's, it, it has no bearing on whether or not you love God. It has everything to do with the environment of the times. Mm -hmm. And you don't see this just hitting the church. You see this in corporate America. You see this in education. Mm -hmm. There are more online learners than there ever has been in the uh, entire history of the educational system worldwide, Got it. not just in America, but worldwide. My daughter just recently applied to the School of the Arts, and she's competing against students 
on a global uh, scale, mm -hmm. not just those who are in the state, not just those that are in the city, but she's competing against students in Japan, students in Canada, mm -hmm. um, as well as on the West Coast. So you, you just see transformation, paradigm shifts across the landscape. And you would think that an entity like the church might be able to escape this kind of a wave of change, but that's not true. The church has been caught up in this wave of change just as well. So, so Bishop, in, you mentioned corporate America. In corporate, there is this thing called the great resignation. Sure. Um, I suspect, and I don't know that it's called the same, but I think it, the, the impact is the same. There's been a sort of a great resignation of the church uh, where many during the pandemic, it became bedside Baptist. And then once the pandemic was over, those people who were on bedside Baptist never returned to the physical church. And some actually even stopped watching it on television or on YouTube or, or you know, Facebook Live or whatever. What is it that, in particular, the Afri African-American church, what is it that we can do to get people back to the church, to the physical body of, of Christ? Um, I think one of the, it's more than one thing okay. that is going to be asked of the church in order to achieve that. One is that we continue to love people um, despite uh, their recent decision to stay away for whatever reason. Uh, we have to be mindful um, to guard ourselves against uh, becoming accusatory um, and being mindful not to uh, partner uh, with uh, the, the, uh, the dark side, if you will, and, and, to, and to judge them. Um, th there's a scripture in the Bible that says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And the accusation uh, tendency is strong in humanity. Mm -hmm. we, we tend to find fault relatively easy mm -hmm. and it's hard for us to uplift. It's just, a, I think, a byproduct of our fallen nature. Second thing I would say is that we uh, are going to have to continue to stay the course. Um, some people are losing heart because of the great resignation, because of the defections. They're becoming um, despondent. Another scripture says, um, uh, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And when the leader the, the, the set person who's called to be as Moses was to lead the way, you, you can't afford to lose heart and to demonstrate that because it's going to have a residual effect throughout the ranks. And people are going to begin to become um, doubtful that, that, that a change could come, that you know a restoration could come. And if you look throughout scripture, you see that uh, God specializes in using small numbers to do great things, yep. right? And so in the, in the case of Gideon, uh, the Bible says that when he started out with 33,000 uh, men to fight an opponent, and, and, and the opponent in this case um, may be COVID-19, it could be um uh, apathy, it, it could be doubt, whatever the opponent is, sometimes uh, we empower that opponent more than we should. And so the, the, as the story goes, God whittles down that number to 300. And it was through 300 soldiers that the victory was won. And so I believe that we have to stay encouraged we have to continue to believe that what Jesus said, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church, he meant.
Gotcha. So I think the other thing that's become quite evident over the past several years, uh, and I think this was starting to happen even pre-COVID, but certainly during COVID and post-COVID, is there's this what I consider disconnect between between uh, boomers and Gen Xers, and then some Gen Zs and and millennials and Gen Zs. So there's a there's certainly a generational gap in what I'm seeing in the church. Um, and I think when we met, we talked about this briefly. It's gotten to the point where pastors are now emulating in terms of dress. <clears throat> in terms of the, their kind of style of their sermons and everything else, they're emulating rappers and R&B singers. But the problem is R&B singers and rappers aren't emulating pastors. That's a problem. Yeah. Um, can, can, let's talk about that a, a bit, yeah. if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. You, you're dead, uh, dead on that uh, the church is, is, is guilty of getting its assignment uh, wrong. Uh, we, we're supposed to be salt and light. And what we know is that salt and light are agents of change, if not at the very uh, least impact. Mm -hmm. Right. And instead of doing the lion's share of impacting, we're being impacted. We're, we're taking on the likeness and uh, let, let's talk about the generational gap first. Yeah. Um, the generational gap is undeniable. And, and it's not like there's never been a generational gap before. It's just been that this new generation is seeming to outlast uh, the older generation in terms of influence. Hmm. It, it's like the, the newer generation is is more potent in its resistance to the older generation. Not to say that 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 phenomenon is brand new. So what's the difference? What's the difference maker? I suggest to you that the difference maker is social media. In hmm. times past, there was not the, pre the the existence of social media, the presence of social media. And what social media brings is a platform for, for communication and distribution of content in light speed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for the church to compete against the imagery that social media is putting out that does not look like the church because it's more appealing. Mm. Recently, you guys have had to have he heard the reports about how Instagram was being uh, um, called to the carpet because of the ill effects that uh, it was having on young people, especially girls in, in the middle school ages, mm -hmm. right? Why? Because it was, it was drawing them in, um, uh, it was depressing their mental health. Uh, many of them were suicidal. Uh, many of them were operating at a lower performance rate academically. And so the church is now being sought to address these issues that it has not kept pace with in many instances. Right. right. And, and so, um, Social media influence influencers have gained the ear. It's like they have become the Pied Pipers. They are the modern day MLKs and Stokely Carmichael's and uh, James Baldwin's that that were poets and trumpeters and and orators that would command the attention and the the uh, the sensibilities of of. Uh, generations behind them, it's now it's now social media influence. Right, right. And so that's that's what the church is competing against. And you, you're right, Darren. Instead of being the leader, the 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 shaper of of the environment of the community, 
the, the church has taken a significant backseat. How do we combat that? We have got to figure out how to code switch linguistically, but not lose our identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? And I'm going to go there, Bishop. Um, when you have churches um, walking it out, swag surfing, and that is what our young people are seeing. Right. And that is what us elder statesmen, so to speak, are competing with. And and, and let me piggyback on that real quick. And, it, and is that a part of the, the strategy of this new new church and for lack of a better term, is that a part of the strategy considering uh, we talked a, a minute ago about um, folks who who have been churched, who've been in church their whole lives, now opting to, uh, you know, again, lack of a better term, be bedside Baptist, see things online because we were forced to do that. If this current generation has taken that approach and their children are likewise taking that approach, how much of an uphill battle are we are we fighting here? Because you've got, a, you've got a generation, current generation, who may have been church, who have now kind of switched their ideal um, of being in the body, in the physical church. And the kids that they have are likely not going either. Right. So, so you guys have thrown me a, a major, major fiery ball. Um, <laughs> So the question was, is it an uphill battle? The answer unequivocally is yes. Um, the other factor that you threw in there on top of Darren's comment uh, and question was um, Bedside Baptist. Bedside Baptist is a phenomenon that's gained incredible momentum because of COVID-19. And what did that do? That showed that the church would go on without me being in the pew, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to think about it psychologically, What, what, how people are interpreting that. They're saying, well, I don't need to be there because the church is still gonna go forward. Mm -hmm. In the, watch me, in the context of what I understand church to be. Now you have to remember is what church, is, is the way church being presented really what church is intended according to the Bible. Mm -hmm. That leads us into Darren's question. And the answer to your question about swag serve is no. That, <laughs> that is not <laughs> what we are, are called to be. We, we, we are no different than the world when we do that. When, when we take on those uh, tricks, mm -hmm. I, I call them tricks. Yep. You know, we we how why why would I think this any different than the baddest club scene in Atlanta, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. the best club scene in New York, yeah. or in L.A.? It's no different if that's what we're going to do, and it is a gimmick to try and. Uh, attract and to survive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's not what I think true survival looks like. Right. Does it, does the, the church need to evolve? Yes. Mm -hmm. But not in that context. And here's what I mean about does the church need to evolve? I remember when uh, I presented to our church um, that we were going to incorporate a electronic giving component. Man, the pushback that I faced at that time was unrelenting. Yeah. We, no, I'm not. I'm, why? Because they wanted to be able to write their checkout 
and they wanted to put their cash in the plate, one or the other. And for me to, to suggest that an electronic giving model would be acceptable was almost sacrilegious. Right. Yeah. So this is what I mean by evolving. Not that we bring the club into the church because the club is where you go to find a hookup. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. It's where you go to to unwind and yada yada. yada. That that's that's not what we what we mean by evolving. So that actually leads me to a question, Bishop. Is it is it when you say evolving and I get where you're coming from in the context that you're speaking of, but do you think it's an evolution? Or is it a revolution? <laughs> I need you to clarify your question as far as the it. Okay. Is so, it so evolution or it a revolution? Yeah. So the it is what I consider now the modern church, because to me, evolution is exactly what you're saying. All right, guys, we're no longer giving uh, tithes and offerings through uh, checks and 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 dollars right we're going to try this electronic form format right we're no longer going to have sister sarah stand up and read the church announcements <laughs> right. we're going to just make church announcements on the video screen on the to video. me that's evolution that's yeah, growth right right uh but from a revolution standpoint it is all right enough of what you old heads have done in church we're going to bring we're going to bring swag surf and walking it out in church because we want church to be hip and we want to do exactly the opposite of what our parents and our grandparents did. Mm -hmm. That is the revolution side of it. So it is exactly that. It is a revolution that is seeking to um, uh, <laughs> break down the door and take over and remain. Well, that is exactly what's happening. And when you see the response of uh, persons who come under uh, a questioning for their methods, um, you can tell that this is a revolutionary type of move, hmm. right? Uh, I'm going to I'm going to mention two additional aspects of of the church that you you see. Uh, prominently in social media being discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, one is Pastor Michael Todd. At last year, mm -hmm. he he did a Easter service uh, that uh, was it, it just went viral, probably in a matter of forty eight hours. Mm -hmm. um, it it was his idea that um, the old model of Easter Sunday was not effective. And so he brought what I believe is uh, the world and established it on the platform uh, to the point that what, you know, one of the clips that continues to play are the three women who kept talking about uh, that he's he, he wants a fatty. I don't know if you saw that, but he, and they were doing this little rap uh, that he wants a fatty. He's got you, he's got to have a fatty. What are they talking about? They're talking about their their you know rear end, mm -hmm. and that was the requirement of whomever the guy is that they were interested in. I, I believe that that's sacrilegious. Mm -hmm. I, I believe it is it's a defilement. And if you look in the scriptures, you will see where individuals defile the temple of God. If you know the names um, uh, Hophni and Phineas, these are the, the sons of Eli, the priest. And God judged Eli because he didn't deal with his sons. Mm -hmm. His sons came in and they slept with women and they, they, they took from the offering what was not theirs. Mm -hmm. And God dealt with them. Why? Because they defiled the temple. Mm -hmm. And what I believe is happening is a lot of defilement in this, mm -hmm. in this season of time. This has absolutely nothing to do with um, 
me not being a Gen Z. It has zero to do with that. It has everything to do with a God consciousness. Another prominent preacher made the comment that because uh, you had some individuals who were sexually active when they came to the church, as opposed to a virgin youth, that for him to tell the person who had had gotten um, who had who had experienced sexual uh, uh, contact, uh, that uh, it, it would be wrong for him to try and speak to them, teach them, preach to them the same message that he would to a teen virgin hmm. or at a teen who is who uh, it, it, it has started being sexually active. And he, he used these words. He said, I will now have to give you a different gospel. Hmm. And I said, listen to this. Paul said, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. Mm -hmm. If I teach and preach any other gospel, let me be accursed too. So the revolution is undeniable. Mm -hmm. It's not an evolution. It is this attempt to desecrate the house of God and to call that which is profane holy and that which is holy profane. Yeah, I, I honestly believe and, and I know in my heart of hearts that the gospel of Jesus Christ has always and always will remain the same. Yes. What is different are those people who are delivering the message. No uh, doubt. And I think that is kind of what we're uh, we're up against as we as we currently speak. And again, I, I'm far from perfect, uh, but I know I serve a perfect God. And uh, so it, it does make it interesting when you're seeking a church home or when you're trying to work your way back to church or whatever, uh, because you have a lot you have a lot to consider. Uh, I think much more so than we used to have in the past in terms of uh, what church we're going to attend, uh, who, who we're going to follow up under, uh, because there's just so much that's out in front of us uh, to, to have to think about as we as we journey back into the house of uh, house of the Lord. Um, speaking of which, let, let's shift just a bit, if you guys don't mind. Uh, let's talk about church hurt. Uh, a little, uh, because okay. I think a lot of people um, have have fallen out uh, over church hurt and just haven't made their way way back. Right. Number one, um, how do you think someone who's experiencing church hurt, what they can do to make their way back? And then what do you think the church can do to accept those people back? Because being a cycle breaker means that you are in the forefront of what is happening. You gotta take the hit. But if you look back on what you've overcome, your perspective on what's happening next would shift. Just the same way it says, you know, uh, some assembly required to get free and stay free and stay healed, some disassembly is required. I speak that people will see you and they will recognize that a shift has happened and they will ask you, how did you do it? What's good, soulmates? This is your boy, Chill. Hope you're enjoying the episode. But we wanted to reach out to you and just say thank you for all of your encouragement and support of the Soul of a Man podcast. It's been tremendous and we are grateful. We need your continued support though. So while you're watching the episode, make sure that you click like and also make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Truly, from our soul to yours, thank you. Now let's get back to the episode. Yeah. yeah, let me piggyback one real, real quick, Bishop, um, and just say, um, 
and I, and I know you've got a background in counseling as well. How would you counsel that person that has been through that, that church hurt? And you and I have had conversations. Um, I had the truly a privilege and an honor um, of serving as a business manager for my church in Brooklyn. And uh, as good of an experience as it was, and I truly, this was coming off of me having worked with the NFL, um, I wanted to do some sort of work that would be giving back to my local community there in Brooklyn um, and something that would put me in a position to serve. And the experience, as good as it was, um, is coming from a different perspective, attending the church and being a part of the body of the church and truly working and being an employee of the church. Um, it, it, you know, you, you see things through a different lens, um, so much so to a point where my senior pastor, um, who I reported to, told me, you know what? you may want to change your membership because this was my church, my home church said, you may want to change your membership because um, the congregation, um, my flock is not going to leave you alone in your role um, to come here and worship. Or you may want to change the service and go to a service where you won't be bothered so much. But I came out of that experience um, a little broken with the institution of church a little hurt with the institution of church um, and still extremely spiritual, have a relationship with God, the whole nine. But I am one of those who felt that church hurt and have had a difficult time path getting back to the, uh, the four walls of a church. Okay. So, so let me say this. Um, I'm going to try and do this methodically. One, it's important for us to appreciate that not all church hurt is equal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not all church hurt is the same. Um, and it's not all at the same degree. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's critically important because we throw the term, the phrase out and it's, it's all bundled together and it's not equivalent. Secondarily, um, if I were to ask my wife, I was, I was just a holler, babe. What's what's my what's my biggest job? It, 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 she she would reply quickly, meeting the expectations of man. Mm -hmm. Okay, why? Mm -hmm. Because some people would think that my biggest job as a pastor is to preach the word. That's not it. Mm -hmm. It is managing people's expectations <laughs> and because of that truth um a lot of my energies are exhausted mm -hmm. in trying to meet that high demand because people are coming from all different experiences yeah. different origins different um uh, protocols uh, within the context of their understanding of church. And with that, when their expectation is not met, some of them are hurt. Mm -hmm. Case in point, give you a real practical example. <laughs> some people come from a family church environment some people come from a mega ministry environment, <clears throat> two different paradigms. Yeah. Family church environment is expecting to see the pastor when they get sick. Yeah. Yeah. The mega ministry model, you ain't going to ever see Joel Osteen. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. So you have structures. What a lot of people at the at the family church don't appreciate is that the Bible supports those structures. For example, it's called the Jethro principle, the Jethro principle, because Moses being called to his assignment, 
was trying to act like he was a family church pastor when he had thousands of people that he was responsible for. And he was trying to touch all of them and answer every situation that they needed. And his father-in-law, Jethro, thus the name, the Jethro principle told him, son, what you're trying to do is absolutely suicidal. Mm -hmm. If you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to kill yourself. Mm -hmm. You need to go and find the good men, the leaders of your church and assign them accordingly. He said he put some over the hundreds, some over the fifties and some over the tens and there let them handle the issues. If it's something that they can't handle, bring it up the ranks and then you'll make the decision. Now, some people will have an absolute problem with you saying that and will be totally put out if they don't get to see the pastor when they have uh, a pet that passes away. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Now, now here's the other thing, uh, uh, Mike, that you've got to appreciate. As a pastor then, I believe that your pastor in Brooklyn missed an opportunity. Mm. His opportunity was there to put boundaries in place to help you in your role as you served the larger need of the church in that capacity. If he could put boundaries in place, it could have helped preserve you so that you don't become burnt out, so that you don't become bitter and consequently feel uh, estranged from the body that you really loved and the place of worship that you needed. Yeah. Because of his inability to put those boundaries in place and to own that his intent is not to, when he tells you, you need to go someplace else because my people are not going to change. Mm -hmm. he, he had the, the power to put things in place and it could be this simple. And this is what I've done at our church. Mm -hmm. We do not conduct business on Sunday morning. <laughs> business is out. Yeah. Everybody is in worship mode, period. Yeah. If he had done that, set it from the pulpit, set it in the church meeting, set it at the business meeting, set it at the staff meeting, he would have shielded you, placed a boundary in place, put a boundary in place that mm -hmm. could effectively aid you in not feeling estranged or the pressure to have to make a decision, a choice. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I have to tell you, Bishop, you know, this was my guy. I mean, this I it, it, he, he, had, he had been my pastor for 10 years before I went to work for him. Right. Uh, truly my guy. And I, and I, and I truly do still love him and his family wholly. Right. Uh, but because the hurt came from him. Yeah. It was that much harder to swallow. Right. And the hurt came from him. Right. Yeah. It's still my guy, still my guy, but it was a, it was a hurt so deep that came from him. Was that me putting more into the man than into God? Um, I wasn't worshiping him by any stretch of the imagination, but there was a genuine love for him and, and what his mission was for the church. And it just wasn't received like that. All right. I'm going to say something that might shock some of your listeners. I think it could very well be that it was more that you were developed in terms of leadership than he was. Mm. And a lot of times we expect pastors to have been prepared as leaders when they're actually prepared as orators. Mm. Mm. We, when you go to seminary, they're going to give you a class on hermeneutics and homiletics, which is the, the, the science of exegeting and preaching respectively, but it's not necessarily a class that teaches you how to lead people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the case in point. My example with Jethro and Moses, 
Moses was called and his his calling was to speak. Go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. Right. Yeah. He did not go to class in the same essence, so to speak, although I may have to go back and, and change that slightly because the reason he was uh, one of the things that that took him so long to get the uh, the calling in place, he was leading the, the sheep. He was leading the sheep. Right. So this was his church. Uh, uh, theoretically, it was his church. Mm -hmm. But he didn't have a whole lot of pushback because sheep just bad. <laughs> right. If we could get some some people who just said little uh, and, and were were accommodating um, instead of challenging, it would be a lot simpler for pastors. But that's not the case. We have people who challenge you. And sometimes the challenging process is it, it exceeds the capacity of the leader. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the leader is not gifted as a leader, then the leader needs to seek out ways to get stronger as a leader. And yeah. oftentimes that doesn't happen. Yeah. And let me speak to this other part about church hurt, because there are times where church hurt is, is authentic. It's where somebody within the body, not necessarily the leader alone, hurts you. That's real. And what every person who deals with church hurt must remember is a scripture in the Gospels that says, forgive, lest your heavenly father not forgive you your trespasses. And this is not to minimize what somebody endures. It's just to say that at some point, every wound scabs over and a healing takes place underneath that ugly, dark, bruised scab. Yeah. What I think a lot of people who endure church hurt experience or choose to do is to is to preserve that wound instead mm. of allowing it to heal mm. and to confess it, which is, as it were, releasing it. And so they carry the present day pain with them as a badge of honor. And if they don't remain at the church, they take the pain to the next place and they infect that place with the dialogue of their pain. Woo. It, it reminds me of being in a bad relationship <laughs> and then taking that pain to the next relationship and to the next because you expect those people to do the, the exact same thing that the person who hurts you did. And why do they do that? Because they're unhealed. Uh, you, 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 you got to get off my pew, Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> you, you done crawled up on my pew. <laughs> you got to get off my pew, man. Hey. Uh, Bishop, stay uh, stay on his pew. <laughs> you ain't gonna let him off the hook. That, that, that just got real. That just got real, real, real quick. But but think about it. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of the reasons why you have so many people going to bedside Baptist is not just because of the pandemic. Some of those are because of church hurt. Yeah, yeah, and because they've opted to walk in unforgiveness. What's this? What's this? That's not that's not the the the, the Crips. That's Seely saying, "Until you do right by me, <laughs> ain't nothing good gonna come to you until right. you do right by me." Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You old wicked so and so. You, you. That's literally what a lot of Christians are doing. Yeah, yeah. And they carry that off the screen, out of the pew of the theater, yeah. and, and out of the pew of the church from one place to the next. And here's the problem. Here's the, the unfortunate thing. They will rehearse that at the girls' night out. They'll rehearse it at the, 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 the pinochle and bidwist table. They'll, they'll rehearse it at the spades table. They'll rehearse it in the locker room. They'll rehearse it at the PTA board. Why? Because they're carrying this. 
Why don't we carry that same thing when we are hurt in corporate America? We find a way to release that, but we don't let go when our pastor disappoints us, when the deacon or the elder uh, uh, hurts our feelings, when they don't give us our song to sing in the choir. We find all kinds of reasons to remain hurt. And ultimately, guess who's losing in this? The, the, the person. The person who's hurt because they won't let it go because the other people have gone about their business. Moved on. Yeah. yeah. That's the insanity of carrying unforgiveness. Yeah. Recently, my wife was, was talking to my daughter about um, Jesus being on the cross and praying the prayer, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Now think about that. He's without sin and he's being spat upon. He's being mocked and jeered. He's being pierced in his side with a spear. He's had a crown of thorns pressed in his head. The pain was still fresh from being whipped as he carried his cross to Golgotha, right? And he gets to that place and looks up and he's still praying for these individuals. That's what we should be emulating instead of trying to emulate T-Pain and uh, Cardi B and, and, <laughs> and every other club uh, superhero yeah. Uh, 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 R&B rapping superhero that we can we can point to, right? But we are missing the mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 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 church. I'm gonna pivot a little bit because a few things we got to cover. I'm running out of time here, and um, uh, I I knew this was gonna be the case that uh we 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 could sit and talk to you for hours, um, but um historically the church has been really the center of our communities not sure that it's still holding that that same has that same stronghold um and position and place in the community as it did before but um you know what is what do you feel about the church and its responsibility from a financial standpoint um to help teach financial literacy for one and also um, to help nurture and build and grow the communities around it. Uh, we, we talked at one point earlier um, about um, uh, a, a group of churches in Charlotte um, along the same stretch that um, we questioned whether or not it would have benefited them to do more together to make sure that they protected that community from gentrification, black uh, historically black community, um, would would it have benefited them to do more together? And why couldn't they come together um, to try and help maintain this? In some areas along this stretch, historically black community. Yeah, you, you once again you give me this multi-dimensional questioning. This is <laughs> tremendous. Um, uh, the answer to part A it, about the church and, and the role that it played historically, and does it still have the same cachet today? The answer is no, we don't have the same cachet that we once did, say, for, uh, during the civil rights uh, movement uh, period of time. But the church is still an integral um, uh, player in the community context. Um, I I lean to the words of Christ that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So she's not going away. Yeah. The church is going to remain. Um, the church has opportunity on top of opportunity to regain her footing, to regain her voice, and to leave an indelible mark upon the hearts and the minds of the righteous within the community as well as the unrighteous within the community. The righteous outside of the community, as well as the unrighteous outside of the community. Now, that's going to take a calculated effort. It's gonna take a strategic um, uh, approach. 
we, we're not going to just get there by singing the old Negro uh, spirituals. Uh, it, it's, it's not going to happen if we all just gather for coffee, which is a new paradigm and a prominent paradigm you find in the church where people like to come together for coffee before they go in and corporate work, corporately worship. Hopefully during those times of coffee, there is meaningful exchange of, of ideas of how we can collaborate. So you, you referenced also the collaborative, the collaborative opportunity amidst yeah. different church bodies. Yeah. Uh, Solomon said uh, that uh, two is better than one. Mm -hmm. Just take that principle. Uh, mm -hmm. In Deuteronomy, it says one can put a thousand to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. Let's deal with that mathematically. That means that if I don't give my effort to the cause alone, but I partner with another, I somehow or another multiply my efforts exponentially. And then if, if that's true, then three would put us at 100,000 to flight because 10 times 10 is 100, yeah. right? So clearly the opportunity is there. What's the barrier to that? Mm, right. <laughs> uh, the, the barrier is whose name is going to headline. Mm. The barrier is who's going to get the chief seat at the table. The barrier is who is going to experience the lion's share of the revenues. Mm -hmm. And the only solution to that is humility mm -hmm. that that we we got to get to the place where we don't care right. if our name is not called yeah. or if we don't get as much of uh, the the benefit as uh maybe a a corporate entity might who who sits in in a power position at some point, you got to consider it not robbery. Jesus, uh, the Bible says, uh, thought it not robbery, being equal with God uh, to submit himself and became obedient even unto death. That's the problem, gentlemen. There are not enough pastors that are dying to themselves. Well. I have participated, and I say this because I've been a part of this work. I've been a part of these conversations where we are trying to coalesce. That's the word that I continually use. Let's coalesce, which means what? Let's come together. Let's not just sing Kumbaya. Let's come together and put our hands to the plow and push together. But I'll tell you, I think that there's there's not only i call that a human issue there's economic factors there's social factors to include more than just um uh, you know positioning from the standpoint of first second or third but there's there's racial divides mm -hmm. Not just denominational, but there's, there's, there's racial divides, there's denominational divides, there's educational divides, there's, there's experiential divides. There, there's so many different divides that stand in the way of this kind of work coming forth. But the church has its role to play and has the opportunity. It's no different today than it was in the days of our great grandparents. Good stuff. <laughs> In, in the in the purest of sense. Yeah, we know we're in a information age, but in the purest sense, the opportunity is still there. The mandate has not changed. It's good stuff, good stuff. Bishop, we are, again, pushing our followers. I got two quick things for you. We, we again, are pushing our followers as they move through this journey with us in our second half. Um, our second half of, of, of life. Um, and we want them to move forward um, with a solid, healthy, spiritual 
footing, okay. uh, relationship with God. What are your words to our viewers um, to make sure either they stay on this path or they come back into the fold and continue um, on this path uh, towards a stronger, better, more solid relationship with Christ? Remember the scripture says that the end of a thing is better than the beginning of a thing. The end of a thing is better than the beginning. How you end mm. matters more than how you started. You may have been hurt along the way, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter in the fullness of the equation if you're willing to get up and try again. A good man falls seven times, Proverbs says, mm -hmm. but he gets back yeah. up. Right. That right. means that I may have suffered tremendous blows systematically in, in, in multiples, but if I have a winner's heart to say, I will not quit, then I can continue to pursue my better end. If in fact you believed at one point, mm -hmm. but you saw a poor model, a poor example, my prayer and my hope is that you will realize that God's not a man such that he should lie. Mm -hmm. Even though a man may have lied to you, a man may have mishandled you, a man may have disappointed you. There's nothing that you will be able to present in the final analysis regarding what other people have done. When we have to stand before the Lord, mm -hmm. we're gonna have to give an account for what we have done. You have no control over what another person does, but you have 100% control over what you do. Good stuff. Good stuff. Darren, did you have anything else? You know what, man? I'd not dare ask a question after that. <laughs> um, I think uh, that is a great way to bring this to a close. Bishop dropped a jewel on us right there. Uh, I'd be foolish to ask a question after that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna supersede you as the elder of, of us two though and, and and make one final request. Um Bishop, we shared with you we came together to do this after a lot of conversations that Darren and I have had. We didn't want it to be fluff, we didn't want it to be um too much of what not too much anything like what we have seen in some other podcasts and things. Um that are, are are out there in social media now. We really wanted to be something that would impact. Um, our initial thought was brothers, but brothers and sisters who are yes. who are living this second half. Um, we have um, it's been a journey. We haven't quite hit a year yet. We're coming up on it quickly, but it's been a journey. I know you you um, have had entrepreneurial pursuits, are an entrepreneur yourself. Um, so you understand that this that entrepreneurial life isn't an easy one and it was at our base that we wanted more than anything to make an impact on people's people's lives um i ask of you final thing if you could pray us out um and help darren and i stay on track in regards to what it is that we are trying to bring forward with the soul of man podcast and we'll call it a night. Absolutely. Gentlemen, I'm incredibly encouraged and inspired by what you're setting out to do. Uh, I think you have a opportunity of a lifetime. And some of those things come uh, at times when we might think we've passed our prime and our best days are behind us. But I would submit to you that you have not seen the best yet. Let us pray. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, uh, we give you praise, glory, and honor as we 
acknowledge you with a grateful heart for what we have experienced today and what we have enjoyed in days past has been nothing short of a blessing from above. But God, what we also know is that you don't run out of blessing. And so I pray that you will bless these gentlemen, bless the soul of a man podcast as only you can to reach beyond the length of their hand, to impact beyond the strength of their greatest blow. And God, beyond the deepest wisdom that they have garnered through their personal study, I pray, Father, that you will do exceedingly and abundantly beyond that which they could ask or think, not only for them, but God let their listening audience tap into the river that makes glad the city of our God because of their sacrifice and their labor of love. It's in your precious name that we set this prayer before you and we have radical faith to believe that you hear. And if you hear, then we also have the answers that we desire of you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bishop, thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. And we know we'll be talking to you again real, real soon. You blessed us. You blessed us with this. Gentlemen, it was my honor. Thank you. Thank you.